I am so blessed and pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Captain William A. Robinson, U.S. Air Force retired. Uh, as you all know, if you read your email, former POW, let me give you a brief bio because it's worth listening to. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bill to, uh, to speak to us. I got a chance to hear him a couple of weeks ago. Um, great guy, great speaker. William A. Robinson was born in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. He enlisted in the United States Air Force after graduating from high school in 1961. After several assignments within the United States, a year tour and a year a year tour in Korea. At that time, he was an Airman First Class. He was transferred to Thailand to serve as an Air Rescue and Recovery Unit in the spring of 1965. In North Vietnam, on September the 20th, 1965, flying aboard an HH-43B helicopter during a rescue mission to save a downed F-105 pilot, Airman First Class Robinson and his crew were shot down by enemy fire. He and his crew survived the crash, but were soon captured by enemy forces on the ground. He spent the next seven and a half years as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. After his release and return to the U.S. in 1973, he was one of three enlisted men to receive a direct commission to lieutenant in the United States Air Force by President, then President Ford in recognition of his conduct while being held as a prisoner of war. In addition, he was the first enlisted man to receive the Air Force Cross, a Medal for Val Valor, second only to the Medal of Honor, which is our nation's highest military award. His Air Force Cross is currently on display at the Air Force Enlisted Heritage Hall, a museum located at, uh, on Maxwell Gunter Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. He earned a Silver Star, Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, POW Medal, two Purple Hearts, along with 17 other awards and decorations. He is also honored at the Elgin Air Force Base Museum and the Vietnam Prisoner of War Display. He, along with Neil Black, is listed in the book titled Honor Bound, American Prisoners of War in Southeast Asia as the longest held enlisted POW in American history. A biography of his life has been realized, The Longest Rescue, written by Dr. Glenn Robbins, and it's available on amazon.com. After serving in Vietnam, Captain Robinson completed Air Force aircraft maintenance training and was assigned to the 33rd um, Fighter Wing at Elgin Air Base as an air, aircraft maintenance officer. He retired from the Air Force in 1984 after serving his country honorably for 23 years. His service includes 12 years enlisted and 11 years commissioned. Captain William Robinson now resides in Madisonville, Tennessee with his wife, Laura May. Bill, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to hear you speak again. The floor is yours, brother. Welcome home. Brian? You're the host. Can you unmute him? Brian, are you, or Bill, are you there? Where are you? John, can you, can you unmute him? I'm looking. Okay. I'm looking. Well, hope we didn't lose him. There he is. There he is. Yeah, Bill, you need to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm asking you to unmute. Oh, there you okay. go. Okay. You How's that? There you go. That's much better. All right. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. It's, it certainly is an honor to be here to share a few minutes with you today. And uh, normally when I have a little bit longer period of time, I try to set the tone for the, for the upcoming uh, speech, uh, talk that I'm giving, by just listing some of the titles of the books that were written by former prisoners of war of the Vietnam era uh, when hell was in session. Missing in action, courage under fire, in the presence of my enemy, they wouldn't let me die, the long road home, returned with honor. These were some of the titles of books that have been written to kind of tell the story of our experience in Southeast Asia, which I know many of you have 
your own stories. And in fact, you know, there's basically uh, 7 million stories in regards to service within the, our country during that period of time. I'd like to take you, roll you back until early times when I was about eight or nine years old. My grandfather took me down to the cotton mill where he worked in Eastern North Carolina. And as I stood before this massive plexiglass wall, as a nine-year-old, I was just looking at name after name after name. Finally, my grandfather broke the silence of what I was looking at. There was a, this big wall, as I mentioned, and the side it was an American flag. And he started telling me about that wall, about the men and the women in his community, his co-workers in the mill, the sons and daughters of co-workers, that when our nation came under attack in 1941, stood up and said, take me, I want to defend America. We went over some of the names. In fact, uh, my dad's name, my uncle's name, several of my senior cousins, all, thank God, came home. We discussed a few of the, my neighbors. I didn't know until that day that, that my neighbor across the street had a twin brother that was killed in World War II. I didn't know why Rufus, the neighbor down the road, walked with a limp came back home and went back to work to the cotton mill and like nothing had happened. That today I learned Rufus was injured in battle and he wore the scars forever. You fast forward to my generation, ours, you might say, we have a wall with over 58,000 stars on it of those of us who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we all enjoy today. I like you, I guess, when I volunteered for the armed services, you know, I, I was a, always knew that I had this obligation over me that someday when I would, if I was able-bodied, I'd be called upon to serve my nation in some capacity. So rather than wait around to be drafted, I went ahead and uh, volunteered. And I guess as most of you, I learned this, we, we learned the first thing we ever learned about the military was that recruiters, weathermen, politicians and used car salesmen had all graduated from the same school. Mine sent me to Lackland with one change of underwear on a, and the Air Force was on a four day vacation. You might say that we were a pretty smelly bunch by the time we did get to show our uniforms. We went through our basic training. At that time, the Air Force basic training was broken up in two sections. One, basic at Lackland, and then you went for your advanced training and the completion of your military basic training at your next base. And I headed out to Shepherd Air Force Base. And, and uh, when I got there, I got introduced to, uh, to what the, they, you know, they came by and I, we call it a dream sheet. You know, they hand you a dream sheet and said, where would you like to go? Well, my brother-in-law, I just returned from Alaska and I thought that'd be a great place to go. So I volunteered for Alaska and when the uh, assignments came down, three of my classmates went to Alaska and I went to Altus, Oklahoma. So, you know, I knew that the Air Force and I were on the same frequency right there. At that time, Altus was a SAC base and once you got SAC massage, you were, you were done. You were, you were a career oriented, you might say, but I found out being a helicopter crew chief, signed to a B-52 wing, uh, didn't have much preference as far as SAC was concerned. Next thing you know, I had an assignment to Osan, Korea. I headed out to Osan, Korea. When I got there, they, they put another one of those dream sheets in front of me in about the fourth or fifth month there. And so I, being a clever young airman by that time, I just wrote anywhere USA on it and handed it back in. And I found out instantly that'll get you a trip to the chief's office, and, you know, and I headed up to the chief's office and he explained to me all of these statistics, you know, and, and uh, I, under his guiding hand, I filled out my dream sheet, including uh, my home area, Seymour Johnson in North Carolina, my state of choice, Florida had more helicopters than any other base in the United States, in the area of choice, Southeast, and patiently waiting for my 
assignment to come in and was Grand Forks, North Dakota. So I knew right from the beginning that the Air Force and I was on the, on the same frequency, but I also remembered something that Will Rogers said in 1934, that it's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. Well, I arrived up there, the first thing I heard was uh, the our detachment would be closing. You need to think about where you would go from here. I mean, at that time I had three years in the military and I thought it'd be a good time just to go to house. But anyway, this thing called Southeast Asia, as most of you know, back in that, that time, we didn't even call it Vietnam. We just called it Indochina, you know, and, and, uh, and it, all of a sudden I'm being selected for a, a trip there. And when I got the assignment, I looked look back over my three years and I wondered to myself, was I prepared for what was going on? I felt like I was a very fortunate airman. I had been on active duty with those who had fought World War II in Korea. I had sat in the break room and listened to the guys talk about the Bay of Pigs and realized, you know, how important communication was because it basically the Bay of Pigs, we all know, was a complete failure based on communication, not on firepower or our ability whatsoever. I was on active duty during the Cuban Missile Crisis and I saw the finest rise to the top. And then we jokingly say we sent so many airplanes to Florida, we thought we had to put pontoons around it to hold it up. But we went through it in a matter of hours and things went back to normal. I was in Korea when our president was assassinated and I saw my leadership rise to the occasion and we as a country moved on. But during my Final days in Korea, you know, I had my first opportunity. I turned 21. I had my first opportunity to vote. And I was this guy that stood up and said, I'm not going to send American boys to do what Asian boys seduce for myself. And at that time, I thought that was an excellent idea. And a year later, I was sitting in a prison camp in North Vietnam and saying, what did that guy say? You might say that I went over in April of 65 uh, not knowing exactly where I was going because, you know, like I said, it, you couldn't put the two words together and it was just Southeast Asia or Indochina, but you couldn't say Vietnam, you couldn't say Thailand, you couldn't say Laos, you couldn't say Cambodia. You just, and so, you know, there's, a, there's all this make-believe world going on. Finally, I arrived at a little outpost seven miles from the Laotian border in Northeast Thailand and, and was told what our mission was. We were going to be running a rescue operation. As most of you know, through your military career, that you always get the mission a lot sooner than you get the equipment to do the job. So we had to take an off the shelf airplane, which was a HH-43B and make it into a combat airplane. It was designed for LBR, which stood for local base rescue. You've probably seen in some old films that not paid any attention to this airplane flying up and down the runway with a fire bottle underneath it. And they were for crash recovery. And we, Basically what we did, we put a quarter inch steep, uh, piece of steel underneath the pilot and the co-pilot seat and we sat on a World War II flak vest and back. And that was what we had to go to war. We didn't have the fuel range we needed. So again, the ingenuity of Americans put together and the next thing you know, we had in-flight re in in -flight refueling on our helicopter. It was basically a 55 gallon barrel, two quick disconnects and a garden hose. But we, need, we needed the range, so we figured out how to do it. And in the unofficial Air Force record, I get credit for two bombing runs over North Vietnam with a 55-gallon barrel. We were scheduled for a three-month tour, and in, in July of 65, uh, when we were had our bags packed, we were headed ready, ready. They sent a new airplane over, and of course, most of you know, anytime you get new equipment, it has problems. Well, the Air Force had thought they had bought the perfect airplane. Unfortunately, they had not made any arrangements for our replacements. This was our replacements. And when they run into problems, then we were extended for the duration. And so we, we were extended. And, and uh, on the 20th of September, 1965, flying along with the other airplanes, we flew a mission over North Vietnam. A simple thing, uh, the one good thing about uh, pilots, you know, when they're dive bombing or bombing at 400 miles an hour, they normally can get out of the target area, which makes a, a rescue relatively safe. 
unfortunately, we had not completed all the procedures we needed at that time, and, and they wouldn't even let us get airborne until they had located a pilot on the ground, which meant that they were looking for them the same time we were. And when we finally arrived there, uh, we set up and we located the pilot and we bingoed in on him and uh, we were down and I was the hoist operator, which is a cable that we dropped down to pick somebody up off the ground and I'm holding red cable since I had 90 feet of cable hanging below the airplane as we came into the position to pick the pilot up. A lot of things happened very really quickly that, uh, you know, uh, the A1Es that were supporting us, they took a hit in a rocket pod and as we were uh, in a, a rescue mode and, and they asked for permission they, to download the ordinance in a local area and, and they were not given permission to download. So they had to peel off and go out to the ocean to drop bombs. And while they were gone, then all hell broke loose and we fell some 90 feet to the jungle floor. And that's when my life began, a new beginning, you might say. I was shot down. I walked away from a plane crash. And then I was tried to evade the area. We got far enough away to feel safe because you knew they were going to come in and blow the airplane up. And so we had to get far enough away that uh, we would be safe in a, uh, in a incoming monument run. As we waited for darkness, we could hear the voices of the Vietnamese as they closed in on us. And eventually uh, there were, they announced that they knew where we were. And I can remember my pilot looking at myself and Airman Black and saying, live to fight another day. We were taken from the captivity at that point and we were hogtied and we were taken down out of the mountain area we were and put on public just like a prize, like a prize trophy. At first, the people were just curious to see the, these big guys coming in, you know, we're a foot tall and 100 pounds heavier than most Vietnamese. And next thing you know, someone shows up with a blow horn and all hell breaks loose and uh, we're getting the hell beat out of us. The Vietnamese would get us out of that position only to take us to another. We went through several villages that way, being placed on planet Bislow and being a curiosity, but turning into violence just because of a blow horn, you might say. They got a little more sophisticated after a couple of days and they took me out and I was lined up. I was blindfolded with my hands tied behind me at my elbows and my wrists and my feet tied together and uh, uh, so that I could only, only shuffle, but they took me out in front of a crowd. I, I couldn't see them, but just by leaning back, I could see there was people there and the talking that was going on. And the next thing I know, I'm looking down, I'm looking at a freshly dug grave. And I, I was thinking at that point, my life was over. As I see from the shadows behind me, there were two guards standing with weapons pointed at me. And I could hear the voice of someone, a leadership quality, you might say, addressing the crowd. And I was getting ready, you might say, to witness my own execution that I would never know again, or my family would never have any idea what ever happened to me. But as the thing got heated, the next thing you know, the, something was said and the, and the two guards came up and lowered the guns and picked me up underneath my shoulders and took me back to the makeshift cells I was in. Whether that was real or her, or for my benefit, I don't know, but I do know that the Lord sent me a message at that point that I would survive and not knowing exactly what the future held, I knew that, that someday I would have the opportunity to turn, return home. We were eventually turned over to the regular military and we spent a few days traveling by boat, walking uh, in a truck. We were finally arrived in the city of Hanoi and taken just about a block from the head of what we now know as the Hanoi Hilton. They took off our blindfolds so we could see the massive walls, the, the 25 foot high with broken glass and Constantino wire on the top and the real prison. And I can remember one of the guards thinking, saying home, you know, and I'm sitting here thinking all this time the negotiations have been going on and I'll just be stopping through here, getting a new 
clean set of clothes and I'll be headed home because my, my mind was on San Francisco, not Hanoi. But when those big doors opened up and we were shuffled inside and I was separated from the others and I was taken through a long maze of hallways and ended up in the back corner of the Hanoi Hilton, which we know now as New Guy Village, in a cell that was no larger. I could stretch my arms in either direction to touch the outside walls. And the only thing in there was a bed that was about uh, probably 14 inches wide, about four and a half feet long, more designed for Vietnamese than an American, with a bucket at the end of the bed. And these were the original accommodations at the Hanoi Hilton. No more had the flip-flop of the guards gotten out of the, the sound of them leaving the area. Uh, a voice rang out, identifying himself as Colonel Robinson Rice and the senior ranking prisoner of war at that time. And his first words to me was, be prepared to die for your country. Here I am just a month after my 22nd birthday and I could think of all the other things I'd rather be doing than having this as my guideline. But he did follow up with one other thing. He said, if we return, if we survive, we must return with honor. Next thing I know, the, I had been stripped and I'm just standing there in my birthday suit. And next thing they they opened a little peephole in the door. They handed me a short shirt, a long shirt, a short pair of pants, a long pair of pants, much like pajamas, a bar of soap, a tube of toothpaste, a toothbrush, a hand towel a mosquito net, a blanket, and a metal cup. And as I looked at those things sitting there on my bed, little did I realize they would be my worldly possessions for the next eight Thanksgivings, eight Christmases, and eight New Years I would ring in captivity. Essentially, <clears throat> we were completely cut off from the outside world, no TV, no radio, no cell phones, no mark, Nikes. We wore the uh, tires cut from the sidewall of an old car tire. The cells we lived in were relatively small and most of us spent anywhere from eight to 12 months in solitary where some guys spent over four years in solitary confinement. By the end of 1965, there were 62 prisoners of war known in North Vietnam. Probably the most difficult thing that ever happened was Robert McNamara. In January 1966, he stood before the world and he said, you know, that American prisoners of war are expendable. We laughed, but could you imagine how your family would have felt if the leader of your war sent them a message to tell them their son, your husband, your brother, your best friend is expendable. He tried to laugh it off and saying, well, what he did was try to get pressure off of us so as the, you know, that the Vietnamese would leave us alone. But in reality was he was trying to get us off the front pages of the newspaper. Not only did he succeed to get us off the front pages of the newspaper, we didn't make the paper at all for a long time. Many of us developed different methods of how we would deal with it. We, the, the encouraging thing we had was in the new shoot downs would come in, we'd ask them how long the war is gonna last. They said, can't last three more months, we'll be home before Christmas. So we had a three month schedule of when we're gonna be out of there. I, I personally chose a three day schedule. Yesterday I was shot down today, today, tomorrow I'm going home. So that only had one day to work with to maintain my physical and mental, mental attitude and be ready to hit the ground running when the whistle did blow. We asked what gave us strength, you know, and I guess that, you know, you go back to some of your Sunday school lessons that you heard years ago when, and, you, and I can remember my mother and one of those things that, you know, that you'll never be burdened more than you can stand. We adopted the simple mottos that have been around for years and years. Never give up, never give in, roll with the punches, bounce back, be ready for the next round. But most of all, we never lost sight of one thing and that was return with honor. At first we were tortured for military information but then it was basically old. So then the Vietnamese turned to 
uh, trying to use statements made by us as propaganda. And you see towards the end of the Korean War, they used the Korean POW, the Americans, in their war against, to mobilize their people in the Vietnamese did the same thing with us. And they, uh, our leaders were well aware of the difficulties we experienced and they said, uh, you take torture up to a point, but not to sustain permanent injuries. No one to say when, that was the important thing. You know, and, and, and always control the situation. And that's what we strive to. I was moved out to the Brad Patch, you know, and, and uh, we were, we lived out there for a year and a half with no running water, no electricity. And uh, we were tied up in the mornings and untied at night. And we lived that way for a little over a year until finally our health was starting to fail. and. They had to bring us back and I never realized that I could simply define civilization as just running water and electricity. It was when we came back it was the first time we'd been, most of it at that point had been in solitary, semi-solitary confinement, but it was the first time they had, because of numbers, they had been forced to put us in more uh, into a cell. The problem was they were just like we were. They didn't think the war was going to last that long. So they didn't want to spend a lot of money building accommodations knowing they weren't going to use them. So they essentially uh, held off as long as they could. I can remember when we moved into cells, it was only a few days later that the words of LBJ came over the loudspeaker and said that, you know, they'd stopped the bombing. You could, if you'd been listening, you could have probably heard us shout with joy, knowing that we were homeward bound in the very near future, only to discover that we were not even included in the negotiations, which essentially was no in negotiations. And we were essentially expendable, as Robert McNamara had said. We had uh, depended on each other and we still depended on each other, but in that, in that, when he stopped the bombing in North Vietnam, he cut us off from the outside world. We had no incoming information. We had that, we didn't have that new, new troop coming in there with that word of optimism. They can't last three more months. We'll be out of here before Christmas. We were, we were essentially cut off from the outside world for almost three years. In fact, the way we found out that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon was on the back of a sugar pack that somebody received in a care package. The sad parts of that time, you know, it, um, we sat there while they, they negotiated and in a, in a nine month in, in negotiation, they decided and they, they were able to establish what kind of table they were gonna sit at to negotiate in the end of the Vietnam War. Thank goodness we had a change of administration and it was an optimist move for us because next thing you know, the Vietnamese out there digging foxholes. So they knew the change of administration meant something. We kept what I call faith, the four faith. We had the faith in ourselves that we had the tools to get the job done, faith in each other that we would stand shoulder to shoulder and eventually return home with honor. Faith in our country that he would not abandon us in a difficult circumstances, but most of all, faith in our God that he would see us through. After Ho Chi Minh died, we started seeing an improvement in treatment as a result of, uh, we didn't realize how much hatred he had for America, but you might say that they gained a little bit of sensibility, you might say after his death, and. Uh, our, our treatments improved, and it, but we were still, you know, our leaders were still kept in solitary confinement and they weren't allowed to uh, mingle with us. Probably the greatest event that happened to us is that, uh, you know, the International Red Cross, because the Vietnamese would not recognize the Geneva Convention, would not provide any care or would not allow to inspect prison camps. The American Red Cross did send care packages to Vietnam, but when they found them on dead North Vietnamese soldiers in South Vietnam, then they ceased. But the Vietnamese eventually allowed our families to send us simple things like a care package, which consisted of 
um, a t-shirt, a handkerchief, a bar of soap, a tube of toothpaste. Uh, they wouldn't let them send cigarettes, they let them send pipe tobacco, and then we they gave us the uh, pipes that had been sent. And, and I think at the time when a friend of mine was sitting there and he was just cradling a pack of Kool-Aid, and you said, well, that was just a pack of Kool-Aid. No, that was the first contact he had had with his family in over four years through a pack of Kool-Aid. And it meant a world to him. And I can remember it in the, in the care packages I got, and I had got some photos and I was very excited to, of course, the Vietnamese, you know, wanted to know who all these people were and, and I was explaining to each and every one. And then I got to some people and I didn't have a clue who they were, but all of a sudden had some new, new third cousins, you might say, and I, I gave their life history. And when I got back and showed my pictures to my roommates, I said, I don't have an idea who this is. And I said, that's so-and-so's wife and kids. And so, you know, that's when we learned that our families, you know, were praying together, playing together, and, and standing together in our absence for on our behalf. We learned through a lot of these things that President Nixon had invited the families to the White House. That was not done under the Johnson administration. He ignored, he just told our families to be quiet and let him deal with the problem. The next thing was the Sante Raid. And Sante Raid was a prison camp much like the Brow Patch that I had to be in an area and the conditions were failing. And someone approached President Nixon and says, you know, we can go in and we can extract these Americans out of this prison camp. President Nixon looked at the points and go for it. And unfortunately, just a few, a week before, basically, the, they raided the prison camp and they were moved out for the same reason we were moved out of the Bry Pass. And uh, no one was rescued. The mission went off flawlessly. And those guys who had trained for nearly five months down at Eglin Air Force Base wept, thinking what a failure they had been. And it was only two years later when we could embrace them and tell them what they had done for us. Well, as a result of that, the expendable was replaced with high value, the isolation. Could you imagine a guy in four years of solitary confinement walking into a room with 40 other guys? I saw the military that we are part of at its finest. When they went into the rooms and tried to designate their leader, the senior rank officer stood up and said, I'm in charge. And in some rooms, they went five and six deep each time. The next senior ranking officer stood up and took his place. And we won our first major victory with the Vietnamese because we stood together. One of the things that we can say that as a result of, of a few, there was probably 30 or 40 guys who would not have survived another two years under the conditions we were living under but we were able to get together and support each other and unified and get some medical attention that was needed for the guys. And we were all were able to come home and live a reasonable life with our families. You might say as a result of the, those few, our life changed from hell to a livable hell. It always brings out the thought of mind of, of a young man named Mike Christensen. Mike Christensen was a, a young, got his first new pair of shoes when he was 13 years old, living in Southern Alabama. Conned his mother into signing for him to join the Navy when he was 17 so he could help the family financially. And went on to become a flight officer and was shot down in Vietnam. But even under his poor conditions, he said he always remembered there was an American flag in his home. When we got together, Mike took the opportunity. He gathered the material from wherever he could, took a clay tile from the roof, mixed it with cigarette ashes and made the colors he wanted. In the back of that long sleeve shirt that I mentioned earlier, he donned the first American flag in North Vietnam. When he had completed it, he proudly displayed it to his roommates and they all stopped and rendered a salute in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mike secured that flag 
during the day and at night he would put it in an obscure corner of the room so that the Vietnamese couldn't see it from the outside, but his roommates could be reminded of, of what we were all about. He, um, one day the Vietnamese found that flag and they went absolutely to ballistic. And Mike, being the person he was, went charging to the front of the room, according to Senator McCain, and took ownership of the flag so as not to get anyone else hurt. Eventually, Mike would caught a rifle butt across the back of the head and fell into the floor and the Vietnamese dragged him out feet first. And essentially, Mike was the last guy tortured in Vietnam, not for anything, but just because he wanted to share an American flag with his roommates. He was eventually brought back, beatered and battered, and McCain said that they weren't sure that he would survive the night. But with cold water, washcloth, and prayer, they nursed Mike back to health. One day, Mike sat up in the middle of his bed with a proud look on his face and a grin from ear to ear, and he looked at his roommates and says, time for flag number two. The short version of Vietnam could be easily described as hours, days, weeks, months, and yes, even years of boredom punctuated by terror. President Nixon, when he took over the war, started to live up to let the Vietnamese fight their own war and get back into the advisory capacity. In fact, when I was shot down, there was less than 20,000 troops in Southeast Asia. It went up to over 600,000. By December 72, we were back down to somewhere around 20,000 as we negotiated an honorable end. Vietnamese uh, came to the conference table and President Nixon put the issue of the prisoners of war on the table and the Vietnamese he said, no, we're, we won't discuss that at this point. And they got up and walked away from the peace table. President Nixon unleashed what was referred to as lying back at two. For a period of 11 days, taking one day off for Christmas, we dropped more bombs than has ever been dropped in the history of mankind, not to advance a war, but to serve the freedom of some 591 known American prisoners of war in North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. After that bombing, I think about heroes. I think about Walter Ferguson. He was the first die, the man to die that night. Walter Ferguson and I, when I looked up his bio, realized that he and I had been at Altus, Oklahoma together in 1962. We probably never met. We may have bumped shoulders, but I know I'd seen his B-52 going into the airway and he'd seen my helicopter doing his thing, not knowing that 10 years later, he was gonna give his life for the freedoms that I enjoy today. The Vietnamese came back and immediately signed an agreement after the bombing. And on 12th of February, 1973, the first group of prisoners of war were released. A friend of mine was asked, could you identify freedom? And he simply responded, doors with inside knobs. I received the welcome home that belonged to you guys that I'm speaking with today. I can't imagine how you felt when you arrived at America's shores in your uniform and there was somebody to tell you, remove your uniform so as not to offend anyone. We proudly got to wear our uniforms across country and we humbly accepted the, the welcome home that belonged to you. As I look back on Vietnam, it always be to me the saddest moment in American history is when we forgave those who ran before we as a nation stood up and said thank you to those who served. Yes, 7 million in uniform, 3.2 million served in Vietnam, yet in the 2000 census, we have 12.2 million Vietnam veterans. In fact, I just got something yesterday that it's only 400 of us, 418 of us alive from the Vietnam POWs, but the VA is treating 1,085, but they choose not to explain where all these other POWs are and where they came from. But in terms of losses, 
Over 300,000 permanent injured, over 58,000 dead, over 1,500 still missing in action. Over 20,000 kids grew up without a father. Me personally, only one out of five air crew members shot down over Southeast Asia survived. So I can truly say I'm one of the luckiest men alive. We didn't lose Vietnam on the battlefield. We lost it in the press here in America. When Walter Concrete, when Johnson said, I lost Walter Concrete, I lost the war. Unfortunately, in our generation, our press did not have the ability to separate the war from the warrior. So in, a, in their mind, if the war was bad, the warrior was bad. And it stayed that way until the Gulf War when they sent our sons and daughters and our nieces and nephews and the same people, the Kennedys, the Fonders and the Carries came out and tried to criticize them. It was a Vietnam veteran who stood up and said, hell no, not again. As a result of the actions of the people I'm speaking to today, our country was able to separate the war from the warrior. And no matter what you felt about the war, you felt the right thing to do was to honor our warriors. In closing, I'd like to share with you words of a friend of mine who has long passed on a POW. He said, during my years of captivity, one idea has dominated my thinking, how fortunate I am to be an American. I have seen the other side. I have had every real and imaginative fault of the United States of America pointed out to me time and time again by my captures. But I have returned with a strong conviction, although we are far from perfect, our system excels all others on earth and that our basic ideas and principles are honorable and just. And in his last paragraph, I was thinking he was speaking to the young people of this land that have taken on the responsibilities that we burdened so many years ago. I have faith that we will continue to work for a peaceful world and freedom while firmly resisting those who would enslave mankind. Ronald Reagan once said, some people spend an entire lifetime wondering if they made a difference. Our armed forces doesn't have that problem. I have an old World War Two POW that's passed on now, but he gave me a bumper sticker that I have here in my room and it simply says, only two defining forces ever offered to die for you, the Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul and the other died for your freedom. Yes, when we think about this great land and what it means to all of us, you know, we know that some people dream the dream some people live the dream. Our armed forces defend that dream. God bless the defenders of the dream. Thank you. Bill, I, I don't know what to say except uh, God bless you. Thank you uh, so much. And I, I know that there's probably going to be people that have things they want to ask you. Um, <clears throat> I want to say um, this is a this is a forum that I wish we could be together and greet you personally. Um, and the best we can do is just uh, I, I, I guess I know I'm speaking for everybody on this call uh, on this meeting that we deeply appreciate what you've done for us and your being with us today. Um, as I experienced when I heard you speak uh, at Newtown Park, um, very inspirational, very humbling. Um, I really, really appreciate you. Um, thank you so much. Do any, does anybody want to ask a question? You can do it on um, chat uh, or yeah, on chat if you want to. Um, there we go. How old were you when you were captured? 22. 22. I turned 22 in August and shut, shut down in September. And I came out in February and turned 30 in August. Hmm. So 
I logged 11 calendar years in the Orient. I went over in 63 and came back in 73 and had a short spurt of four months back in the States in uh, 64, 65, and the rest of it was uh, uh, with Vietnam. In fact, I, I officially get credit for 10 remotes. The Air Force wouldn't give me credit for a long tour. <laughs> yeah. I got a copy of your book, uh, and I appreciate it. I, um, you made me pay for it, which I'm really, a re and I'm just kidding, but you signed it for <laughs> But it is a very well written book, and it's a lot of very interesting information about you that I found to be fascinating. Um, and I, I commend that book to our members. You'll find it to be uh, it's it's easy reading from the standpoint. It's hard to put it down. It's compelling. It's a very compelling book. The, so name one, the, book, the, 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 name, the short name of the book is The Longest Rescue. Yeah, go ahead. I said, once, once you get, get back to having a regular meeting, I'll come down and have a, a, a book sale. <laughs> well, I'd love to do that. I'd love for you to do that. Yes, absolutely. In fact, what we've already, we've already been, to, already pretty much decided that we're going to start, when we do finally get a chance to meet face to face, we're going to continue to uh, have a virtual component to the meetings because there are people that are uh, joining us even today that, are, that live out of state. It, some of them have been members that have moved away and then they, they can now come to our meetings without having to, you know, drive from Florida or whatever it might be. So, <clears throat> so the title of the book is, it was a long title, but the short title is um, The Longest Rescue. Just go on Amazon, look for The Longest Rescue. You'll find it. And I called you Bill. Your name is William A. Robinson. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, Bill is, uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the guy you don't like at the first of the month, Bill. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, like, like I said, I, I grew up as Billy, and when I was in school, I was called William, and when I joined the military, I became Robbie, and, and now I'm just Bill. <laughs> can you, uh, can, this is interesting to me, too. Someone asked, can you tell us a little bit more about the actual release uh, when you were actually liberated and released from prison and, and, and you're coming home, what is, can you tell a little bit about that? Oh yeah, we were, you know, like, like I said, the Vietnamese came in after the agreement and on the 26th of uh, January and read a proclamation in the courtyard and uh, that would, we would be released and it would be an incremental release and that, uh, you know, we would be released sick and wounded and then in order of shoot down, and that's the way we came out. The first, uh, when the first release was uh, on um, February the 12th, it was three different airplanes with 40 on each airplane. And the reason for that is that the airplane had plenty of capability, but they did not know our conditions at that time. So they were prepared for anything. They brought, in fact, they, you know, they had 40 straight jackets on bed, and they had litters, they had, uh, comfortable seats, you might say. And the biggest thing that scared everybody is all these senior pilots, you know, look up down there, the first lieutenant driving. <laughs> they wanted to go up and sit in the jump sheet so make sure that he didn't screw this thing up. <laughs> it just, just didn't feel comfortable for them, you know, to uh, spend that long over there and then send a first lieutenant over there to pick them up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was one of the first things we had to get over, you know, and, uh, and when we arrived in the Philippines, we were given a, a real hero's welcome, and uh, in fact, I celebrated Valentine's Day in the Philippines, Guam, Hawaii, and San Francisco all in, a, in one flight, you know, I might say, and then I arrived at uh, Scott Air Force Base in the middle of the morning, and, uh, and uh, the funny story there was uh, we were not supposed to meet anybody, and the, and the gate guard called his supervisor and said, "Sir, we uh, have uh, people at the front gate wants to go in and meet and greet the prisoners of war." And they said, "Well, I just tell them to go away." And he said, "You don't understand. There's five thousand of them." And <laughs> 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 so he called the base commander and the base commander told the supervisor, says, uh, uh, you know, well, tell them to go away. And he said, commander, you don't understand. There's 5,000 of them. 
And so they made provisions and brought all those people out at three o'clock in the morning in a snowstorm just to uh, just to wave a flag and say welcome home. And you know, this was a uh, a humbling experience for us. And we flew in the next morning to uh, and ride at, uh, we went to Norfolk, Virginia and dropped off Jeremiah Denton. And, and the ones that were going to Norfolk, then we flew on up to Washington, DC and and uh, met with our families up there in the early hours of the morning. But yeah, it, uh, it was a, a wonderful event, uh, you know, and uh, one of the things that did happen, the, the the uh, release got such positive publicity as far as the Vietnamese were concerned, they decided to release 20 other guys unbeknownst. They just called the U.S. and said, we're going to release 20 more guys, just send us an airplane. And when they got there, the guys refused to leave. They said, it's not our turn. And they said, we're, we're not, we're not going to break code. And they sent some diplomats in there and told them to shut up, put their clothes on, and <laughs> go out the door. They said, you're, you're not breaking anything. They said, don't screw this up. So, you know, like I said, 20 were released uh, instantly for public, uh, you know, for the purpose of propaganda. But, uh, but those guys refused to go because they weren't they're not the next in line. And so, you know, that's, that's how committed we all were that these guys were turned down release until the uh, diplomatic corps came in and said, you know, this is above you. <laughs> you need just to follow our instructions. <laughs> Were you actually released at the same time as the uh, pilot that you are trying to rescue? Yes. Uh, myself and Black, we had spent most of our tour together and my pilot, uh, Tom Curtis, and Will Forby, the guy we were trying to rescue, had spent most of their time together. Unfortunately, after we hit the ground, our co-pilot got separated from us. And I don't know if many of you have seen the movie Rescue Dawn, but that was my co-pilot, uh, Dwayne Martin, that was with uh, Dingler. They, they, uh, in, a, they, in 67, they escaped out of a prison camp in Laos and, and uh, he was killed during, the, during that uh, evacuation times and he had to you know they ran out of food and water and everything they had and and uh, they got too close to the enemy you might say and he was he was killed at that point so we're still hoping to bring his remains home uh, in the future were you aware of jane fonda visit to hanoi when she was there oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. you know we laughed you know uh, you know like i said that in, in some sense, it makes you proud, but it's disappointing. You know, as I go back to when I was a young airman from when I was going to Korea for the first time, and uh, I went in this old crusty old staff sergeant. He was, you know, said, you know, airman, he said, remember, when, when you're going overseas, you represent yourself, you represent your family, you represent the United States Air Force, but most of all, you rep represent the United States of America and to act accordingly. I just wish Jane Fonda had a been in on that, in on that briefing because uh, we're proud and I'm, that she had the right to say it. We didn't agree with it. And some of the things she did was inappropriate. Uh, uh, you know, and you know, the facts speak for itself, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and you know, in any court of law, she would have probably been found guilty of what she she did. There's a lot of add-on stories, you might say, but most of them were created by our own side to try to make what make it unbelievable. And this is a you know a tactic used by most people. And you know, if you if you if you want to, you can make the story. You know, you know, you you mix a bunch of fix, fiction in with facts. And you don't know what's the truth, but they would just weed out all the fiction. And she did wear their uniform. She did sit down at their uh, acting act -act site that was shooting an American airman. So, you know, that's, that's the facts. And, uh, you know, the, all the other stuff, is, you know, they talked about passing notes. That's just some, something that somebody else congregated. And, you know, she, she did call us liars, you know, but, but as far as a note pass or anything like that, you know, but 
Uh, but there, there, there was guys that witnessed her calling each of them. Well, I asked when, when she, asked and, uh, she asked them how they were treated. And uh, she said, my, my friends wouldn't treat you that way, which, <laughs> okay. Well, but, uh, you know, like I said, it, when I went back to Vietnam in 1995, you know, there was a lot of people there that weren't even born when the war was going on. So they, they have difficulty understanding what we were mad about. And that's where the problem we have today. We have rewritten history to the point that, uh, you know, Jane Fonda is, is a hero, you know, and uh, Ronald Reagan is a villain. So, <laughs> you know, how, how, how do you, we, we've got to get back to, uh, you know, and like the gentleman mentioned there, the stories, that's an important thing because uh, uh, we're the only ones that's keeping history alive because uh, the history that our kids are being taught, it doesn't recognize anything that we individual or collectively accomplished. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so that's the important thing that we all leave our families some legacy. I think we all have soldiers and sailors and Marines and Coast Guardsmen in our past that we know nothing about. We just know they served with honor and and let's not let the next generation not have the luxury of knowing what we accomplished in our time here on earth. Thank you. Do you have, did you uh, happen to know Porter Halliburton? Is he on the camp with you? Oh yeah, Porter, great guy. Yeah, one of our members, uh, Rod Knowles, went to school with him at Davidson, knew him. Um, and so I just wanted he asked that. Uh, was John McCain in your camp? He was in the next cell to me towards the end. And, you know, I'd been there two years before he got there. So I always say I was on the welcoming committee when he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Porter, it's a book, I didn't mention it. It's a book called Two Souls Invincible, uh, written by Porter Halliburton and uh, Fred Cherry. Fred was a black guy. and. And Porter was a Southern gentleman, you know, and they figured they could create a conflict between the black and white because Porter come from a, a noted family of the South and Fred was just a, a sheriff from Suffolk, Virginia, you know, and, but they bonded like brothers and, uh, you know, and I, I think that's one of the successes we had was we didn't have any surnames. We weren't African-American. European Americans, Asian Americans, we weren't Puerto Rican Americans, we weren't uh, Mexican Americans, we weren't Italian Americans, we were American. That's great. And, 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 the, and the surnames played no part in what we accomplished. And we stood together shoulder to shoulder, even though sometimes that we honestly, we had political differences, but when it came down to getting the mission done, we were all for the mission. That's great. What did you think of your captors? Your captors. What did I think of them? Yeah. Some of them I could sit down and have coffee with. The other ones I could, if they gave me a nice big blue tarth, I could probably disassemble them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. When I went back in 95, they wanted me to meet with a, a gentleman, and uh, they call him a gentleman but he had fought in the French war. And, and I asked him, I said, is, does he have, is he missing an arm? And they wouldn't answer my question. And finally, uh, they said, yes. I said, I refused to meet with him. And, and you know, my wife says, you know, how are we going to deal with this one? You know, I said, well, what's right, right. And I explained to him, I said, I know he's, he's responsible for beating the living hell out of me. And and I said, I know he's responsible for the death of at least three other Americans, and I won't have their blood on my hand by even recognizing that he's a human being. You know, and and uh, the Vietnamese, we don't understand how you can forgive everybody except him. I said, no, you misunderstand me. I didn't come here asking for forgiveness, or nor am I seeking forgiveness. I'm just coming here as a warrior to meet with warriors and understand that the wars are over and now we have to figure out a way to get along. And, uh, you know, and uh, we, we I'm our, in our group, we vary from different to one. I mean, I, I, I was over in Vietnam, not knowing exactly the dates, but I was there when 
we normalize relationships with North Vietnam. And as a result of that, we've been able to bring around 1,500 of our brothers home and give them the proper burial that they deserve. Had we not normalized relationship, we probably never have been able to accomplish that. And, you know, sometimes you have to give a little to, to get a little, and, you know, and, and, you know, these are the things we, we have to deal with. But I, I, I said, I didn't feel comfortable driving around in our Japanese and German automobiles complaining about the Vietnamese. <laughs> so now, we, now we're driving around our German, Japanese and, and Korean vehicles. And, and, and you know, it, you know I, I, like I said, and um, the, the funny thing is I told people I wore Vietnamese clothes for seven and a half years. I'm still, I'm now back to wearing Vietnamese clothes again. I and, know, uh, me too. <laughs> Yesterday I went shopping for my wife and lo and behold, you know, there was toilet paper up there and it said made in Vietnam, you know. <laughs> so so now they will be wiping our ass. <laughs> That's inspirational right there. <laughs> Like you said that. <laughs> One of our members first logged on said that he was using a camera for his webcam and he got it and he said it on the box that is made Vietnam. I said, well, that's 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 just the way it goes, you know. But I like the idea uh, toilet paper idea. I'm gonna have to remember that. <laughs> oh my. Bill, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your uh you're sharing everything you shared with us and I look forward to meeting you again someday soon. And um, we will look forward to having you join us at some time if we, when we get to meet again in person. We'll, okay. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Yeah. I appreciate everything and uh, thanks for the opportunity and look forward to being with you guys some someday in the future. I, I really think that, uh, you know, it's kind of like my doctor said, somebody asked me, doctor said, what do you think about the virus? He says, well, I'm not allowed to uh, discuss politics with my patients. <laughs> <laughs> now you find about Jane Fonda again, you see? <laughs> as much as I hate to cut this off, I think we're, we don't have any more questions. I don't know. Uh, um, I've, I've enjoyed this more than I can tell you. And I got to tell you, it's a new record. We have had almost nobody. We have 80 people on this call and, not, on, and almost no one has dropped off, even though we're 20 minutes past our normal quitting time. So that speaks to you. Brother. It speaks to you. So thank you again. Thank you so much. John.